Good morning. Good afternoon. This is Ning Li from IUCN Environmental Law Center. Um, I'm working here as a program officer and as acting as the focal point for compliance component for the SRJS program implementation at the global level. Um, I'm really happy to welcome you to today's webinar. Um, before we start with the webinar, um, as usual, we, we have a few basic rules for webinar participants um, not, to, uh, in, not to interrupt at the very beginning when the speakers are talking. So we would like you to mute your microphone and uh, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to, uh, to type into the chat box um, and if you have any uh, technical issues, um, please write to me at, uh, through the, the um, chat box or send an email to my colleague Monica Pacheco Fabic. Uh, we will be very happy to uh, assist you. Um, so again, very briefly, um, I would like to um, start with uh, just a very brief introduction of the center that I'm working in. I believe some of you have already heard this and in the in the previous webinars, but we, I just quickly go through it. The Environmental Law Center where I work, it was established in 1970 in Bonn in Germany. Uh, we are outposted unit of IUC headquarters. Our headquarters is based in Switzerland. And uh, we are staffed by 12 legal and information specialists. This particular office also manages um, a gateway to environmental law called Ecolex, an online database that IUC jointly operate with uh, the UN Environment and the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN. Um, and uh, we also operate uh, an environmental law library on the ground floor of our building. Um, so this is the general introduction of who we are. And this is also just a snapshot of what other topics that we work on following the IUCN three program areas from 2017 to 2020 global strategy. Um, so in the first um, IUCN program area, valuing and conserving nature. We focus very much on information and knowledge management concerning environmental law. And the second uh, program area, effective and equitable governance of natural resources, is the area that uh, most of our work uh, fell in. Um, we work on various topics including species, in particularly on illegal wildlife trade, wildlife crime, uh, or environmental crime. Uh, we work on protected areas law. We work on integrated planning and land use, on um, water issues, particularly transboundary water governance. We work on marine issues, in particularly um, mangroves conservation, as well as uh, international negotiations for areas beyond, beyond national jurisdiction, uh, that is the high seas. Uh, we also support IUC in, in advancing its work on natural resources governance framework. And uh, last but not least, we also work on access and benefit sharing, assisting the implementation of the Nagoya Protocol to the Convention on Biological Diversity. Um, so this is the second program area we work in, and the last program area is deploying nature-based solutions to global societal challenges. And under this program area, we particularly focus on climate change and adaptation, especially in um, the Central, uh, Meso Central American uh, countries. Um, so this is just what we do in general. And of course, capacity building and working with the civil society organizations cut through all areas of our work. So we are very happy to welcome you to today's webinar. Um, for today's webinar, we have a very special guest, Gertie from the Philippines. Uh, Gertie is a very active environmental 
activist, if we can say. She uh, not only teaches law, but really practice law and assist uh, the uh, conservation actions on the ground at the community level through the use of law and other tools. Um, so today, the, the floor will be mainly uh, for her to share her experience in the implementation of SRGS project. Um, and I would really welcome other colleagues uh, from, uh, you know, other other countries uh, um, in the in the SRGS uh, initiative. Uh, feel free to share your experience. Feel free to ask us questions, because these kind of webinars is not about really teaching, but more of exchanging ideas. So um, I hope that you will enjoy today's um, talk and today's webinar. Um, I will first give the floor to Gertie, and then afterwards we will open up uh, for your questions and your feedback and your sharing of your experience. So now, um, Gertie, the floor is yours. Gertie, can you hear me? Hello, Gertie? Hello, Gertie, can you hear me? Hi, Gertie. I can hear you. Okay, wonderful. Yeah, now Hi. the floor is yours. Yeah, Please. can you hear me? Yes, okay. wonderful. Yes, um, okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. As we say in the Philippines, mabuhay. So thank you, Ning and Monica and the uh, Ecolex Center for inviting me. The first slide, I'd like to show you just a snapshot of the partners who are involved in the SRJS project in the Palawan landscape. So we're uh, four non-government organizations. The photos below actually show you bits and pieces of the work that has been done by the various partners. But first of all, I'd like to dwell even in a few minutes, like two minutes about Palawan, because I come from what is known in the Philippines as the last ecological frontier. You can see in the slide that we are a, quite a relatively large uh, province in the Philippines. Um, the population is not as big as the urban center of Metro Manila. We, our forest cover is still more than 50%. But we have a lot of poor people in the province. And when you talk about Palawan, um, you are reminded that 30% of our country, uh, country's mangrove cover comes from Palawan. 40% of the Philippines coral reef cover comes from this place. And we're also high in terms of endemism, 40%. We have two World Heritage Sites. We have about nine protected areas here and of about 26 key biodiversity areas, and we're the only province covered by a special law. The special law is called the Strategic Environmental Plan for Palawan. I'll show that in a while, but this slide actually shows you the plethora of laws that actually apply to the last government here. So besides the national laws that uh, govern the province, we also have special laws like um, the province has been identified a long time ago as a wildlife reserve, as a mangrove sanctuary. And in 1992, we have a strategic environmental plan for Palawan. Now the next slide actually gives you a summary of what this special law is all about. It's unprecedented because it's dedicated to the province and there is a governing body called the Palawan Council for Sustainable Development, which is mandated to provide policy direction to implement this special law. And the main strategy of the law for Palawan is what is called as Environmentally Critical Areas Network or ECAN. It's, just, it's basically a zonation strategy. And if you look at the next slide, the zonation strategy provides that there are terrestrial zones and in the terrestrial zone, you have the core zone, restricted use zone, control use zone, traditional use area, and there's a multiple use zone. And then in the coastal area, you also have a core zone, 
you have a multiple use zone and a transition zone. So the zones actually guide the plans, the development plans, including conservation and protection efforts. So this has provided an important opportunity to SRJS partners in Palawan. In the SRJS part um, project, our long-term goal is basically to preserve the international public goods. I think you're familiar with the IPGs and um, through a planning process we did two years ago, we saw the need to actually strengthen the climate resilience capacity by diversity, food security, water in the landscape. And we can do this through a um, governance mechanism, which is also sustainable and equitable. But since Palawan is quite large, the focus of the SRJS project is Southern Palawan, and that covers seven municipalities and one city key biodiversity area. So there's one protected area there and a one and one candidate key biodiversity area. The medium-term goal is actually to protect the existing KBAs, watersheds, protected areas, their ancestral domains everywhere in Southern Palawan, and we want this also expanded and recognized. Because as I speak before you today, while we have so many laws, also deluged with a lot of issues that actually counterbalance the, these important laws. And policies. So just Quickly, what do we do? The Environmental Legal Assistance Center where I work with, we coordinate and facilitate the policy advocacy and governance focus of the project. We coordinate and facilitate engagement with government agencies, plus the partnership building, um, the, the network building that's part of the work we do. And we also want to do this while pursuing transparency, stability, natural resources management, and environmental management. Another part of all non timber first part change program focuses on enterprise. It directly engages with indigenous communities. Their strength is in enterprise development, also on social social development and protection plan. And they link it up with the private sector. So building the capacity of women and men, uh, doing community organizing work, plus enhancing land use and resource management efforts. The um, Another... Our NGO ideas, which is, which is the Institute for the Development of Education and Ecological Alternatives, they also assist in constituency building. But in terms of governance, they engage with um, governing bodies, government bodies like the econ boards, municipal development councils, protected area management boards, and so many others. You have to pardon the Philippines that we have so many acronyms and they have to define them. Ideas and TFP and ELAC work together in also pushing for CADTIS, no Certificate of Ancestral Domain Title Applications with government agencies. And the last NGO partner is Conservation International. Uh, CI assists us in capacity building activities on resource valuation, including rights-based approaches in gender integration and protected area management. They have been very effective in providing us research support because they have scientists and technical experts who have assisted us in assessments. Plus, the Project of Wildlife under the US Agency for International Development, they have also assisted us in the enhancement of multi-sectoral enforcement activities. So now in the next um, 10 minutes, allow me to identify what we have been doing in the last uh, almost three years. So like in this uh, slide, I'm showing you an engagement with the Department of Environment and Natural Resource Office to basically curtail the encroachment into a mangrove reserve. So we were able to successfully remove um, the illegal occupants and um, assisted government in seizing in recovering the rich mangrove area in the city of Puerto Princesa. This is a policy technical working group called Almasiga. Almasiga or Almasiga is used for resin. Okay, it's also an element in uh, in, do, in actually producing paint. Um, our partner here, named Roger of Ideas, has facilitated also workshops 
on non-timber forest products and also governance workshops in the local level. All of us have participated in province-wide environmental summits and district sectoral summits organized by the Department of Environment and Natural Resources. In these summits, we were able to identify key issues affecting communities, um, NGOs, academic institutions, and even government partners in relation to environmental governance and the uh, conservation work. Now, this is also a photo showing our engagement with the local government units and other entities of the Department of Environment and Natural Resources, where we had to actually work together on transparency efforts. There's a governance watch effort by the national government. And then we also had the dialogue with these government agencies to tackle resources issues like uh, plantations in forest or um, how to help indigenous peoples actually enhance their non-timber forest product uh, enterprise development effort. Now, this photo shows an area of a key biodiversity area called Victoria Anipahan Mountain Range. It's not yet a protected area. It's 120,000 hectares. Um, the VAMR, as we call it, as a KBA, is noted as a forest corridor. It contains 42 trigger species, many of which are considered irreplaceable. Uh, this has been lifted from scientific uh, information. So it's also a conser conservation priority area, an important bird area, and also a conservation priority area by the government. And there's a listing of the important faunal species found in the area. But the challenge actually for this area is how are we able to establish it as a protected area pursuant to our laws. Why? Because the area has mining operations. It has also plantations encroaching into its forest. So therefore, the challenge here is how we can enable stakeholders, local government officials, indigenous peoples, farmer communities to actually support the efforts of protecting it further and actually enhancing the current efforts on livelihood development, um, enforcement work, um, local legislative work, because there are ordinances and local legislation in the area. The effort also of the SRJS is for establishing the Victoria Anipahan Mountain Range as a protected area, or an ICA, Indigenous and Community Conserved Area, or an interlocal government managed area. So these are options that we are looking at. Now, this slide shows you that a few years ago, there was a study by um, a science and conservation group, Florian Fauna International, and there you can see that the area has a species richness in terms of flora and fauna. There was a carbon stock assessment, and it's relatively high. Uh, there are forests, uh, but it doesn't show you, in a while I'll show you photos of the, the mining activities in the area. So now our objective in the SRJS partnership is to actually enhance awareness among various stakeholders, because the area covers four municipalities. Basically, it's three municipalities in one city, and then the challenge of facilitating actions among um, government and non-government groups. Uh, how can we build upon local legislative initiatives because there are environmental codes, there are watershed areas, marine protected areas, plus there are also ancestral domain areas within the Victoria Anipahan mountain range. Now, the results of the engagement so far, we had, besides awareness sessions, we had two uh, municipal governments passing res resolutions that actually support the protection of the Victoria Nipahan mountain range as a protected area. So that's a good beginning. Now, in terms of advocacy work, the last five minutes, these are just bits and pieces of what we're doing. And this slide shows you that when we discuss advocacy, we have to be clear on what our goals are. So like, do we want to compel government to this job? Do we want to change policies? change attitudes, or do we want our work to acquire a broader impact, or do we want more communities taking an active role in altering power relations? So these are some of the issues we deal with. Um, I do not have much time, but just to 
share with you, this is a photo of oil palm plantations. The oil palm plantations here have grown already enormously. And our plan is how do we stop them from expanding? Because uh, there are now 8,000 hectares. This is a photo last year of coconut plantations encroaching upon all growth and secondary forest. And this, have, this is something we have tried to stop through advocacy and legal actions. Uh, there are road projects encroaching on all growth and secondary forest, and these are government projects. So that basically puts at risk the remaining biodiversity areas. So we have engaged with government agencies through dialogues, petitions, and meetings. We have conducted studies and research, and we've done our share of petitions calling for a moratorium on the expansion of oil palm plantations. These have been the principles and premises that we have pursued. These are part of our position papers with volunteer scientists and other academic institution partners. We have pushed for these principles. Um, in our advocacy work, a partner handles a weekly radio program. Uh, sometimes we participate in that to talk about environmental law, rights and remedies. We have also organized press conferences and media engagements. We actually won, modestly aside, this is not in Southern Palawan, but in Northern Palawan, we were able to work with Greenpeace and other national NGOs to convince Nickelodeon to withdraw from a Coral World Park project in Northern Palawan. Okay. The continuing threat of mining, okay, in KBAs these are some of the photos and these are continuing issues. There are legal policy issues on the mining law and the challenge is how to pursue um, an alternative mining bill. At the moment, the SRJS partners have to deal with 67 mining applications still in the province. While we have successfully canceled 429, but the government is still entertaining more than 60 more. Okay, the problem now is the weak implementation of our law. We have a special law which protects our natural forests because they are identified as core zones. But unfortunately, our local politicians and government agencies have allowed mining in our natural forest. And then the continuing issues is that um, some of these mining companies, two of them in fact, have been suspended. I'll show you the basis, but they have continued to operate. And there's one mining company uh, that has cut 15,000 trees in 25 hectares of old growth forest. Okay, so these are quick photos. I do not have much time. Just to show you that while we engage government in multi-partite monitoring teams, the MMT, we have showed them this documentation that they have violated their environmental compliance certificates, the law, they have committed illegal quarrying, okay? That's uh, they have mined out areas, and all of this were important factual and legal basis for the suspension. And the company was suspended, but unfortunately, they have appealed to the national government, so they have continued to operate. So that's a challenge for us. Now, this is a WAVES project, Wealth Accounting and Valuation of Ecological Services, which shows that this watershed in Española, which is near Mount Matalingahan, the green part is part of the protected area, but it shows that there is mining inside and there are oil palm plantations inside the area. So this is really disturbing and the challenge is how to stop this through advocacy and legal work. So in the national level, we are pushing for a new mining policy. Uh, it must be evidence-based and it must account for the social environmental costs. Um, Palawan should be close to mining as an island ecosystem. These are, these are the range of perspectives we have. Um, we do not have much time. And these are some of the provisions that we want in that um, alternative mining law. In the legal work we have, I'd like to share an important opportunity because the Philippines has a Supreme Court which passed in 2010, special rules on the prosecution of environmental cases. And we have taken advantage of these rules like citizen suit, um, the application of precautionary principle and the environmental protection order and mandamus in some of our cases and legal actions. And our legal actions consist of administrative and judicial actions. So we have filed cases in the DNR to cancel the mineral agreements and environmental compliance certificates, not only with the DNR, but 
special bodies like the Palawan Council for Sustainable Development and the National Commission on Indigenous Peoples. And as we speak, we still have an environmental protection order case pending before a regional trial court. So this is a photo which shows you the portion of the 25 hectare um, area, old growth and residual forest, where 15,000 trees were destroyed by Ipila Nickel Corporation. So that is still being litigated, okay? And we also do clinicking activities uh, because we push for community-based and multi-sectoral enforcement strategies. So this is a photo of what we've done um, together with government, we've done trainings, but it's not enough to do that one time. You have to do clinicking and mentoring activities. And then my last few slides are challenges. Uh, we have to deal with institutional and bureaucratic issues. So the lesson here is we must adopt a mindset to prepare for these realities. Um, science has a critical role and therefore all our studies and research efforts, mapping initiatives, they should be part of evidence-based approaches. And then you have to also consider risk because the work that we do has a lot of risk. So planning activities are part of the effort. The challenge regarding powerful adversaries, uh, that is a given. Sometimes you also have to deal with divergence in terms of approaches among communities. Uh, it has been painful sometimes, but we have to actually take stock of you know, the nuances of these gains and failures and shortcomings. So therefore, when we pursue our advocacy and legal strategies, we must take advantage of the opportunities that exist, legal and non-legal, and take into account the nature of the, the challenge as well as the capacity and limitations of our partners as well as our adversaries. Um, another lesson is the time. I know we want expeditious remedies, but changing mindsets and perspectives, special perspectives, especially while we engage government is really tedious. And therefore we can never get tired strategizing, assessing our plans and uh, troubleshooting uh, certain risk that we need to face. And lastly, when we deal with communities and we do issue analysis with them, uh, it has to be clear when we, interact with them when we do planning activities, our goals and approaches must be clearly communicated. So there will be no uh, misunderstanding. So even with case conferences, we do that regularly. So they have a good sense of what judicial actions, administrative actions, and even advocacy work would entail. So I will stop here. My 15 minutes is up. Thank you again for listening, colleagues. Mabuhay, as I say. hear Gertie. Gertie, can you hear us? Can you hear me? 
Yes, I can hear you. Okay, yes. great, wonderful. I um, just now I couldn't hear you somehow I, for some reason. Um, to, I just as a kick start of uh, of a discussion with the other participants of the webinar. I um, would like to know a little bit more about your work in terms of paralegal, uh, no matter training or, or actions. Um, have, what, what is your experience in, in that aspect to advance the conservation actions in Palawan? Well, thank you very much for that uh, question, Ning. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. We can hear you very okay. well. Uh, in this photo I'm showing, um, some of the attendees here are what we call as paralegals. So they are community leaders and members who undergo training on law, environmental law, social justice law, and human rights. And they are also um, informed about the rights and remedies. Uh, so we do a two to three day training and then we follow that up with clinicking activities. And in the, in the training that we do, there will be role plays and also preparation of sworn statements, affidavits. Um, and there's a basic training where basic uh, in laws are actually discussed. But there's an advanced training where more role plays and uh, complaints are being uh, discussed. And out of the trainees, there are actually some members who do their, who initiate doing reporting. So they report to government agencies. Sometimes they seek help from ELAC, uh, further advice on the remedies that they do. They can also become complainants. They can become witnesses. Okay. Mm -hmm. And they can, and some of them have become leaders in their mm -hmm. community. In fact, I know of a paralegal who ran as a village official and is now a part of the local uh, politicians group there. So oh. the, the paralegal, yeah, the, the paralegal is uh, considered a community person who has knowledge of laws, rights and remedies, and is able to do initiatives to actually assert their rights as uh, members of the community. So as I said, they can be advocates, they can be complainants, they can be witnesses, um, and they can be partners of government. So that's the, the paralegal. And the value of the paralegal is that because we do not have enough lawyers, our environmental lawyers are few, very few. We're like almost critically endangered in this part of the world. And therefore, it's very important that you have uh, paralegals who can provide you with uh, information, who can help in gathering evidence, in documenting violations of environmental laws and uh, environmental rights. So these are they are important parts of the you know um, participants in the overall effort under SRJS um, project. Right. Thank you very much. Um, I see one question from uh, um, a colleague, Car Carlo. Carlo, uh, I, uh, I read out your question to uh, Gertie. Uh, you explain in one slide that one of the action in mangrove area is demolishing, de demolition of illegal construction. Is the construction belong to community or private sector? And for what purpose? How mm. do you convince the owner to let this action and are they also willing to support this agenda? Okay, the, thank you for that question, Carol. That's a very good question. Um, mangroves in the country, in the Philippines are protected areas and core zones. Now this fellow, um, Cervantes, is a business person. So he, is, uh, uh, he has been involved in business and he has recruited people to professionally squat and illegally occupy mangroves. So he has illegally occupied the mangrove area for more than 10 years. And it was sad that the Department of Environment and Natural Resources personnel have actually uh, failed 
in recovering the mangroves for a long, long time. They were sued. They had a slap suit by this person. So this guy successfully recruited individuals, not poor people. Okay, people, they built houses. One house even had an air conditioning unit. And then he employed people. Of course, poor people, he employed, paid them to actually cut the mangroves and uh, inundate the portions of the mangrove area with soil, okay, and dead corals. So for more than 10 years, that has been the problem until the DENR sought assistance from NGOs and uh, other partners and the new officer was determined to actually have the mangrove area recovered. So these are not poor communities. It's a business person uh, who has been doing this in several parts of the city. And it's just good that after a decade, the area was successfully recovered by the government. But it's not the risk there was that this person sued the village officials with a slap suit. Slap is strategic lawsuit against public participation. He also sued the government uh, officials and the entities. So that slap suit is still being uh, investigated and our group is assisting the village officials in defending themselves. Okay. Great, thank you very much, Gertie. Uh, Carol, I, I, Carlo, I don't know if uh, um, that answers all your questions. Um, you also noted to us that uh, in the presentation, sometimes the voice uh, wasn't very clear. Um, yes, yeah. I, I, I knew that uh, because uh, Gertie mentioned to me before the, our webinar, uh, there has been some power issues in where, where she is and in order to uh, be sure that the uh, connection will work well, not be affected by the power cut, she used um, a separate small facility to get connected to us. Um, so I, we really appreciate her effort. I realize also at points um, the, the, the voice was broken a bit. But I think overall the, um, she, she gives us a very nice picture of what she has been doing in the Philippines. Um, thank you, Carlo. I see that you say it's a, it's a very clear answer. Thanks. Uh, let's see if there are other questions from colleagues or I mean if you just feel like to share a little bit of your experience um, feel free to do that um, I don't see um, any other questions coming in Gertie I have another question uh, in your presentation you showed uh, the biodiversity impact assessment and social and cultural impact assessment. Um, well, we all know in, uh, in many countries, environmental impact assessment is, uh, is compulsory for, for certain construction infrastructure projects. Um, what are these impact, you know, biodiversity, social and culture impact assessment mentioned in your presentation are these also requested by law or is just something that we do through srjs or just a, a practice that you do in your project okay um thank you for that questioning the um, philippine environmental impact statement system it's a relatively old law it considers it should consider uh, biophysical assessments, also geological hazards, you know, um, including social and economic uh, and biodiversity. But having said that, we really have to be vigilant in monitoring the process because the process, with all due respect to government agencies, has been very politicized. Um, the process can be corrupt ridden and therefore the role of the communities assisted by the SRJS partners is to make sure that public hearings, um, documentation are actually in place and that social acceptability issues are also raised. Free prior informed consent 
processes are also recognized because if the vigilance does not exist, um, I have seen so many projects where it's railroaded and the environmental compliance certificate is issued. So while the law provides that these aspects need to be covered, the reality meaning is that the implementation is still weak. I, I've already explained that. And therefore, the vigilance of civil society groups and local communities are very important. And the role of our academic institution partners, because they provide the science and the technical expertise, are equally important in this effort. So mm -hmm. it, it really requires monitoring advocacy work. And if there are gaps, then at times, well, we have gone through an administrative action where we're questioning the environmental compliance certificate. So we are constrained to pursue certain remedies just to make sure that the, the, the law and its regulations are compliant or observed. Thank you very much. Um, I don't see any questions or uh, any requests for sharing of their experience. Yeah, there is another question from uh, Dazzle Lab. Lava piece. I hope I pronounced your, your question correctly. Um, Berti, I read the, the question to you. How important is clear advocacy agenda in bridging the gap between the knowledge information at the national level and the gap at the local level, particularly oh. with indigenous peoples and local communities? What are the okay. future actions of S SRGS partners? Mm -hmm. Well, First, thank, cheers, Dazzle. I know Dazzle personally. Thank you for the question. Now, that's a good question because um, in where we work, in the event that there's an advocacy agenda, example, an alternative minerals management bill, it is our duty and part of the work we do that we translate this in the dialect. We popularize the substance of a proposed legislation and then in our community awareness sessions, uh, sometimes focus group discussions and even case conferences, if the focus is on mining, that these are tackled in the simplest terms possible, devoid of the legal jargon, you know, and the technical terms. So the, the role of the SRJS uh, project, its partners specifically, is that they bridge this as facilitators and um, advocates a few are community organizers, that that link is strong and that the information and data is popularized. And when this is brought to the community, that they have a good idea um, of what the proposed law is. And then the experience of, of the communities are also brought into the plenary in the discussion. And this can be conveyed back to our national partners. So it must be that process okay there must be transparency and uh, accountability in the process so that process takes time there must be warm bodies who are able to do that plus you allocate also time for communities to join the these advocacy meetings plus i think one important aspect there is the mapping you know dazzling you need to have visuals you have to show the maps so if you talk about mining to them vis-a-vis -vis their forest, key biodiversity areas, ancestral domains, the, the visual presentation is very, very important so that they get a sense of the magnitude of the impact and the importance of the law that you're pursuing. So that's just one. Another challenge now is the charter change because you have to look into the proposed um, amendment or I mean, it's not amendment, change of the Philippine Constitution. So right now we have plans on how to simplify the draft, translate this into the vernacular, and then scheduling meetings with the communities. I, I hope I answered the question. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, uh, she said, thank you, mom. <laughs> Excellent response. Uh, what is it? Warm regards and many congratulations. <laughs> Thank you.
Getty, did you get that? Yes, welcome. <laughs> welcome. <laughs> Thank, she you said, as well. Thank you very much. Yes, wonderful. Um, I don't see any other questions coming in. Um, uh, Gertie, if you don't mind, I would like maybe to ask one last question and then we can close today's uh, webinar. It was really, really informative and I'm very happy to see the questions and the interaction between you and other colleagues. Um, you mentioned that uh, environmental lawyers is a kind of like an endangered species. Um, you as, uh, you know, not only someone practicing law with at the community level, but also someone teaching law in the in the universities. Uh, my question actually is um, a lot of these environmental lawyers, I feel uh, to be to be a little bit blunt that are not so much like like you connected to communities to the ground level, of, you know, actual reality. Yes. Um, Yes. Do, is there any suggestions that you can give us, you know, as we as IUC Environmental Law Center, in what way maybe we could assist in bring, bring, bring these um, community of law, law, lawyers to more in connection with reality? Is there any mm -hmm. suggestion yes. on that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a very good question, Nick. Thank you. Um, Right now, ELAC is working with um, an alternative law group network. We have an internship program. Um, we tap on law students during summer vacations or semestral breaks to work with us. Uh, for the first time, we have an environmental justice fellowship. So we have a new lawyer with us uh, for a period of time. And then for Ecolex, I think it's very important uh, if we can have, because you have a, you're a wonderful um, source of information. I've seen your, you know, your in rich material. I think the there can be exchange visits, um, or probably, yes, exchange visits, and how we can connect the webinars to law students, because mm -hmm. the problem in Palawan is the the law school has no Wi-Fi, <laughs> unfortunately. Oh. So we need to have that technology. So. Um, me, I'm, I'm teaching, but our Wi-Fi was not sustained. It would be good to listen to to Ecolex colleagues, you know, um, giving an input to my students, perhaps, and even other law students, so that so that they get also a good understanding of the global environmental law community and public interest environmental law work. So internships, um, exchange visits. Um, to the communities and then exposure programs because our interns actually travel in the Philippines. It's really a standard um, requirement, part of the work that they get out of the office. They see the communities face to face. Indigenous communities, they have to deal with the, the dirty roads, you know, the, all these uh, travel challenges, related challenges. And therefore, with the realities that they see, then they uh, start to appreciate that environmental lawyering, particularly public interest environmental lawyering, is not really easy. And mm. there's a really need to respond to that. So to me, I, I see the connection with the Ecolex um, knowledge, you know, the library that you have, the experience that we have can, can also be part of the contribution that we can share. Because I think our weakness, Ning, is documenting our experiences. We do a lot of inputs, but we lack writers, actually, to and spend time to document these experiences by way of case studies. Perhaps there can be a project where we can actually work together to document these experiences and then share it to, to other colleagues, bring colleagues here, you know, um, on also do webinars with with future lawyers and um, interns, um, right. so that you can we can enhance the internship program and exchanges. Yeah, thank you very much, Gertie. These are very uh, very helpful suggestions, and I'm pretty sure that we 
uh, not only me with you, but also with other partners in Asian or other countries, other continents that we can uh, keep discussing different ways and complementary projects to support your, your effort in, uh, in the Philippines. Um, I really appreciate your time and your, uh, you know, always the, the willingness to, to share your experience and always ready to, uh, to, to engage with us in any dialogue. Um, this, uh, this afternoon, we are going to have another webinar with particularly colleagues from, uh, the, uh, from Africa and the Caribbean regions. Because of the time difference, we, we can only share your presentation with them um, through the video uh, mm. because the, the time difference mm. is so big between uh, Asia and the Caribbean. Uh, we would not be able to bring everybody together. But in the vi vice versa, when we've done the other um, presentation or the other webinar, we will also share with uh, colleagues in the Asia region. Um, so I, at the very end, I thank you again, Gertie, and thank you uh, the other colleagues from other regions or from the Philippines. Thank you for your participation. And let's keep in touch. I think, as I mentioned at the very beginning, uh, we are learning from each other. And I do hope that there will be an opportunity that maybe we could uh, organize something at the regional level. We can exchange more of the experience and lessons, particularly from the compliance, the advocacy, the legal, um, legal mechanisms from that perspective. Um, so with that, I wish you a very nice evening. I know it's uh, late in, uh, in your country. Uh, thank you very much for your time and uh, hope to see you next time. Thank yes. you. Yes, Ning, welcome. It's, our, it's uh, really our ple pleasure to be able to interact with you and share our insights and experiences. We will also be continually inspired you know, in our partnerships and interactions with you. So as we say in the Philippines, mabuhay. Mabuhay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, let's keep in touch. Yes. Thank you.